Stairway to Freedom, Chapter 7, Auras To describe in simple terms the action taking place within the aura of an individual as he or she performs any action would be, as is so often the case in spiritual matters, to simplify the facts to the point where reality would have no further meaning. In essence, the action of the power of God flowing throughout the auras of a sentient being is straightforward enough, but the mechanics relating to and regulating that flow require deep analysis and study. The auras contained within the life force that prescribes the parameters of a human being are several in number and various in hue. It is generally supposed that there are seven distinct auras. It is not so. In essence, there is only one aura, but that aura can be considered to form a number of distinct bands which relate to areas of emotion and intellect. However, a description of such auras would be incorrect if it was left to the understanding of the student that the major bands which constitute the vital elements of humanity are separate and distinct one from another. They are not. They are joined in one continuous octave of light and power which responds and scintillates in response to the urge of intellect and soul. Action takes place in all areas of the aura and it is important to realize that humanity, indeed all life, is interrelated and joined via the higher elements of the aura, both in the sense of all sentient beings being connected and also in the realization that oneness of life is the connection between man and God. Therefore, let us assume that the connection between man and his God is resolved into the beauty of a relationship based on purity and love. Surely, concepts of the highest quality that may never be sullied by interpretation or misrepresentation. The relationship can be of the highest, but it is obtainable in the degree that the individual is able to bring his spirit to the fore in relationship with his ego and personality. Suppression of ego is ultimately necessary before such conditions may be made manifest as to elicit the required state of mind. Ego, whilst necessary for creation of identity whilst the soul sleeps, must and will reduce as soul growth is achieved. Thus, the power of wisdom will seem to gleam in the eye of an advanced soul instead of the glare of ego defending itself against an intruding nation. Such states require great peace within the soul before success comes. How easy it would be if action brought results if fighting achieved goals, and if power struggle achieved oneness with God. The opposite is true. Letting go of ego, of fear, of drive and ambition achieves success. Wisdom comes to those who have nothing to live for in a material and commercial sense, who will never be rich or famous in their time. And yet such people live for everything, gain all, and their names are hallowed throughout the spiritual realms. Can it be that one detects a familiar ring to such concepts? Does it suggest, once again, that real life is at total variance to earthly existence? If so, why is this? God made the earth and everything in it as he created the spiritual realms. He created all life. Why then is the planet Earth the sole area where success, based on measurement 
applicable to that plane is the opposite to success achieved in any other area. The answer is both complex and simple. The simple truth is that it is necessary for most humans to experience heat and cold, pain and pleasure, success and failure, and all the emotions that are available on earth. One must experience them in order to reject most of them and in the process to grow in stature. Could you sympathize with anybody in pain unless you yourself had experienced that pain? Could you appreciate the feelings of those suffering from hunger, thirst, heat and cold unless you too had first-hand knowledge of those matters? So, you grow in stature when you appreciate the things of beauty and true pleasure. Decide to seek those things of beauty and decide to bring them close to you. You grow also when you have the ability to inflict pain and unhappiness and decide not to. You grow as you help those suffering from the results of their own and other people's folly. These things can only be experienced here on earth. Such feelings as life on earth generate can be echoed in other realms of existence and there are other planes where there are startling events waiting to be experienced. But this plane, earth, provides the greatest degree of experience concentrated and concertinaed in time than any other plane. Experience it to the full, if you will. Ultimately, whether you be the greatest sinner or the most glorious saint that ever trod the highways and byways, you will finish up at God's side. It must be said that if you wish to be a criminal, a sadist, a pervert, or a murderer, and you deprive yourself of those experiences through some reason other than the realization of their incorrectness in relation to goodness, then it is possible that you may have to reincarnate in order to experience them at a later date. However, it is not suggested that such desires should be given free reign, but it, it is suggested that imprisonment, unless it truly reforms the character of the miscreant, is not actually the answer to that individual's problem. It does, however, remove from society that individual, thus offering protection to the public. It may be, of course, that such an individual, once he dies from earth and goes to his new home in the spiritual realms, may find himself in an area where he can, at least mentally, if not physically, subject those of similar nature to himself, to the terrors that he would have done on earth and be himself subjected to them until he realizes that there must be better ways of existence and outgrows those concepts. Therefore, it is plain that the planet earth is of vital importance to the growth of immature souls and is the only area to provide such experience. It is also important to realize that we who tread on earth do so because initially we sleep from a spiritual point of view and that it is our duty to awaken the soul. Then and only then can we rise above the limits of the earth. Strange then that the individuals who have awakened their souls often exclude the possibility of the realities of greater life as are mentioned in this publication. Strange that such people who have the opportunity to experience the beauty of the greater realities still cling to the old fear-ridden ways and shut them out. Still, as with all life on earth, physical death brings release. And, once such individuals are able to appreciate the ongoingness of existence, they soon pick up the reins and enter fully into spiritual life. 
We must appreciate, therefore, that the auras surrounding a living object, including humans, interpenetrate the auras of all other living things, and also that they interpenetrate the physical regions of that living organism in the task that they accomplish. Further, once something is touched by God, it can never die. All things that exist have been created by God and are therefore in a state of everlasting life. So the auras surrounding you also interpenetrate with the auras of every human, animal, plant or mineral that was ever constructed by the hand of God and your auras interpenetrate with them. In that way, the past and the present are interrelated, and we may say that time, as understood on earth, does not exist. There is only sequence of events. The future does not conform to this pattern entirely, although the near future relates to the present and is, in part, tied to it. We wish to make it clear to you that, via the auras, you are part of every human that has ever lived, is living, or will live. Also, that you are part of everything from the largest planet to the smallest microism conceivable. All is one. One is all. There is only one, and its name is God. You are part of the one, you are part of God, but you are total God as you were created by God. Consider this concept, meditate on it, it is a great truth, probably the most fundamental truth that you can begin to comprehend. You will not be able to prove the truth of these words until you have advanced to the point where you may operate in the auras then you will know that these words are true. In the meantime, accept, if you can, the value of this statement and allow it to become part of your reality. You will be taking a giant step in your progress. Therefore, from the general, the concept of the greater outline of description of the auras, let us turn inwards to examine the particular the several auras that man can see if he has the faculty and about which such interest is taken. There are, in fact, seven distinct auras that may be appreciated by clairvoyant sight, though, as stated before, the auras are not separate, but interpenetrate one another in a glissando as compared to an arpeggio. The auras interpenetrate the human body at points which have been described in books on mystical matters since time immemorial, namely the base of the spine, the spleen, the solar plexus, the heart, the throat, the brow and the head. These entry points are named chakras and form a connection point into the physical body so that information and life force may pass in a twofold manner between the body and the auras. However, appreciate that the aura relating to any particular chakra is not merely a cloud of colour like a balloon attached to that individual. It is a body of fine matter seated within a planet of fine matter and able to connect or appreciate the reality of all similar life at that level. We add further that each chakra is a living, real and active part of you, placed on a part of the planet of similar vibration to that aura and able to appreciate the reality and value of life at that level which in turn, has realities usually on the physical level. Therefore, it may be appreciated that any particular aura has its base 
within an area of similar vibration to that aura, just as the physical body is placed within an environment of vibration that enables contact with that environment to be made. An aura so placed must, therefore, assuming that the body of the aura is sufficiently developed, be able to appreciate existence at that level and be at one with life at that level. This process holds true for all of the auras that surround a living organism. Not only is the physical body placed on a physical earth, and able to make contact with everything on that physical earth, but each aura is similarly placed. Just as you may contact another human by speech, the process involving physical movement of air, by sight, the process involving physical particles of light, by smell and by touch, at the same time, the auras of any two or more individuals are able to reach out and achieve a communication by etheric means at any level applicable to those individuals. Physical means of communication can, therefore, between any group or groups of individuals, be superseded by auric communication. Should this occur, the limitations placed on communication at an earthly level do not exist and one is able to contact those whom one wishes over vast distances and throughout time. Such means of communication is, however, limited to those who have developed the auras to the point where they are able to sustain the power and weight of the spirit. When an individual first incarnates onto the earth, he is, perforce, born into the body of a baby. That baby is virtually unable to communicate in any meaningful fashion for a number of years. As time passes, the infant grows, and as he grows, so his ability to contact and express his thoughts and ideas becomes greater. Eventually, he matures to the point where he is at his greatest maturity. It must be noted that the level of communication between any two individuals at the height of their intellectual maturity may differ widely. A moment's consideration of, for example, a bushman from Australia attempting to communicate meaningfully with a professor of an English university will suffice to appreciate that levels of communication between people differs widely and is in no way a measure of intelligence. However, to return to the concept of a baby growing to maturity, it should be appreciated that as the youth grows, so the ability to interact with his environment and with those surrounding him grows. The auras of most individuals who incarnate on earth are in a similar state to that of the newborn babe. Thus, interaction and communication, the flow of energy from and to the auras, is at a minimum. This is because, a, most people do not realize that they have auras, and, therefore, b, they make no effort to develop them, and, c, the development is tied to soul growth to a certain extent. Therefore, initially, And usually, most humans incarnating on earth are tied to the experiences of the five earth senses. All else remains unsavoured. However, through the now familiar process of meditation, prayer and devotion to God, the auras can quite quickly become developed, thus allowing interaction in a truly three-dimensional plane to occur. Should students of godlike ways develop the aura sufficiently, then true, instant and accurate communication may occur at will, 
without the need for speech at all. The process whereby this book is conceived and transmitted follows that pattern. Members of the White Brotherhood, far removed from each other in terms of spiritual development, are able to join their minds into a consensus of opinion as to the quality of the information to be conveyed, and then that information is implanted into the mind of the instrument on earth who seeks to receive accurately that information. The process is one of merging of auras and of conveyance of information from one aura to another. The process may be likened to that of a chain reaction where an event triggered at one end moves on until it is mirrored at the far end. At no time during the conveyance of information written here has the aura of the highest, most developed soul actually touched the aura of the lowest soul, but nevertheless the information has been passed from mind to mind until the desire of the group is achieved. This process is open to all who would accomplish the necessary growth. Should any individual achieve that growth, the strengthening of the auras, then he or she is free to reach out with their minds and experience the realities at any level into which they may reach. Often, the only souls that they can reach are discarnate, and even then, they often tend to be guides and teachers, as few on earth have the necessary soul growth to move within the auras. And even in the life after death, the majority of individuals are content to stay within their peer groups. Few venture into the voyages of discovery to be made by transferring consciousness into the auras. However, do not be dismayed. Should you make the effort to achieve the results mentioned above, you will have great freedom. Freedom to observe the planes of beauty as well as the doleful places and freedom to contact elevated souls. So you will achieve soul growth and move towards God that much quicker. Could it be that one is able to contact beings of equal status in terms of development and that such contact would be meaningful? Should contact produce results gauged to enlarge and upon the soul experience of the individual? It is that experience and interrelationship with other people often brings little direct reward. Not everybody is an advanced and pure soul, far from it. The vast majority of humanity incarnate on earth and discarnate is entrapped still within the enfolds of materialism. For do not suppose that lack of physical body brings release from materialistic and earthly desires. Far from it. There are large groups of beings who may have lived in the spiritual realms for long ages, measured by earthly standards, who have not loosed the bonds of desire. They satisfy those desires as best they can by creating with their minds areas of illusion within which they can conform to a standard of discipline and that area appears real to them. They accept that each of them plays a part within the illusion and each individual tends to accept his role and also the role of his contemporaries in maintaining a sense of of realism. This concept may seem strange when it is realized that by expanding vision, the illusion would disappear and freedom would obtain. But the majority of people who inhabit the surface of the earth conform exactly to this pattern. The illusions created by people since the dawns of humanity's earthly existence 
are carefully maintained by creating patterns of behavior to which all must conform, laws being created to perpetrate the illusions and those challenging the sense of normality being removed from society. Should one seek to change the pattern of reality clung to by the majority, the individual concerned is quickly exposed, his power effectively removed and the damage rapidly repaired. Do you believe this to be a true assessment of the civilization within which you live? We are taught not to think along expanded lines, and we are encouraged and rewarded by society for maintaining established concepts and by working within them to strengthen them. Consider, for example, the reaction of establishment if it was proposed that orthodox religion is not necessary and that every individual may have a direct relationship with God and that there are no need of priests, representatives of God, of ceremony, of icons, and of ritual? Is it conceivable that people would be allowed, encouraged even, to sit where they are at home, at employment, in a park, and to meditate without attending church, without having a religious body to direct their thoughts? Can you imagine a situation where all people throughout the world would lay down their weapons, where the armed forces disband, where barriers and frontiers between nations are ignored, where passports and visas are not sought, and people banded together in brotherhood? Can you imagine the reaction of establishment to those concepts? And yet, the truth is, the reality is, that God is in all and everything. Mankind is one. There are no need of churches, of dignitaries, of secret chambers and societies. There are no need of wars, of barriers of exclusivism. They are illusions created by society and carefully maintained in order to preserve what? Illusion. It exists for its own sake, and yet appears real. Soul growth destroys illusion. Therefore, churches throughout the world, by and large, emasculate the soul and make people slaves to religion, and not sons of God. The knowledge that all men are brothers would destroy the sense of separatism, and so each race each country is seen to be a potential enemy to hide the truth, and yet it is so patently obvious that the truth is true. Leaders of religions throughout the world spout doctrines of peace and oneness with God and at the same time perpetrate the exclusivity of their particular brand of religion, ensuring that the simple souls who attend that church fill their minds with false doctrines, thus perpetrating the illusion. It is law in many countries that a particular religion is taught in schools, and in some countries it is law that the indigenous population conform to a church. Whilst there are some benefits in conforming to apparent norm, it does restrict soul growth of individuals, which is unforgivable. It puts off indefinitely the days of turmoil that must and will result from each individual's awakening into the light of truth. Often, as was mentioned earlier, such event is delayed for long ages, even in the spiritual realms, for those who still conform to the normality applicable on earth keep within their own group and seldom encounter an enlightened one. Thus, they reinforce the concept that their normality must be correct, the only way to be. Individuals do, however, awaken from time to time, and they are helped upon the path to reality. We encourage you, in peace and in love, to challenge the concepts to which you conform. 
Do so in meditation. Ask yourself a question and allow the answer to fill your heart. Seek to transcend the limits of your mind and gradually, as you expand your consciousness into the auras, you will feel the truth that those auras reveal to you. You will feel the oneness with God, the brotherhood of all mankind, your oneness with all life that exists. You will be able to explore the spiritual realms and know that they exist despite the mass of indignant people who pretend and hope that they do not. You will sense complete peace as you realize that there is nothing to fear, nothing unknown, no dark secrets withheld from you, that God is a God of love and peace and not the vengeful tyrant that he is portrayed in many books purporting to contain the true message. As you realize these facts, so you wonder why you spent so long in the land of Maya. However, be warned, those who control and are immersed within the grand illusion do not take lightly to looking upon someone standing in the light. They will hurt you with whatever means they have at their disposal. Many countries, now somewhat civilized and allowing certain freedom, will limit themselves to verbal assault, but in some areas the bringer of light will be put to death. It happened to Jesus over 2,000 years ago and could still happen to you. Therefore, the advice given is to follow your God as you can in peace and in quiet. Do not wear your newfound freedom on your sleeve. Jesus himself often encouraged people to whom he brought light not to tell anyone, and the same applies today. Keep your own counsel. Cast not pearls before swine, or they will surely turn and bite you. Disseminate your newfound knowledge only to those who are seekers themselves and who will understand and grow in stature with you. To continue to investigate the material from which the auras are composed and to follow the investigation as to why they exist and why they reflect colour, we need to comprehend the nature of matter. Scientists on the earth have expended a great deal of energy and have made miraculous strides in investigation of physical particles. They have made the quantum leap of realizing that matter exists outside of the realms that may be observed and measured by orthodox techniques. This is good because those investigators have begun to put aside telescopes and microscopes and have begun to work in the areas known as pure physics. This involves the use of the mind instead of the senses, and thus doors may be opened into realms which we call spiritual, but to which most scientists ascribe a more pragmatic appellation. We do not wish to become bogged down by terminology. The point being made is that investigation can effectively and correctly be performed using that most powerful of instruments, namely the mind. Mind is not brain. Mind does not calculate and quantify. Mind is. Mind reaches out into the areas of knowledge and receives information directly. Mind is at one with all that exists, and is a part of the God concept. As such, it is only limited by the individual's entrapment within his body. Should he reach out, he may find. Therefore, scientists working in pure physics are, at last, using the tool that they should have used all along. Their investigations have led to the suggestion that matter exists outside and beyond the atomic particles which constitute physical matter. Their investigation ought, 
ultimately, to reveal to them that matter exists on a number of planes, each separate, one from the other, and yet each joined into a composite whole, which includes the original particle that constitutes the atom that they commenced investigating. This concept of matter relating to various planes was mentioned earlier in this chapter and is repeated now in order to take up and expand upon. It is made quite clear then that a piece of matter may exist on an earthly vibration and would constitute all that we observe round us on earth and that same piece of matter also exists on a number of other realms of higher vibration, to use an expression readily understood, which has its basis of reality in a world visible and solid at each particular level. The same piece of matter is repeated several times, and yet the totality of its several forms is one piece of matter. Why should this be? The answer to this question will lead us into another area which is almost a subject for discussion in its own right and yet must be understood before the question posed can be answered. Matter is alive. Matter is life. Nothing exists that has not got solidity in one area of existence. Therefore, everything is alive and everything is real and solid, touchable and quantifiable. The essence of life is change. Nothing that is alive stays the same forever. The pattern of birth, growth, decline and decomposition, death is an incorrect term as nothing can die, is universal This pattern is vital to the ongoingness of existence. Change is the only constant. If any single thing could remain unchanged forever, all life would cease, as all life is one. A mayfly lives for a few hours and follows the pattern of birth, growth, decline and decomposition. A solar system endures for countless millennia, and yet, unless it followed the same pattern that applies to the mayfly, that beautiful creature could not have existed because it could not have followed its destiny of being born, of growing to maturity, of mating, of becoming feeble, of its life force being withdrawn, and of its body decomposing. The energy so released replenishing that used by the creature during its brief sojourn on earth. All is one. The solar system and the mayfly are one. They must conform to the same rules, and therefore we may say that everything, including the solar system mentioned above, was born, grows, will decline, and will ultimately decay and will release matter to replenish that which it used whilst in its prime. This fourfold process is necessary because flexibility is the key to continuance. Change is an inbuilt requirement for living. Thus, as any creature or object exists, it is studied by an arch-angelic force who exist to control life and who are termed the directors of life, and note being made of any shortcomings in that being studied, so that improvements may be effected in the continuing strive towards perfection of that object. Once change has been effected in that particular object or being, then, of course, change will be required in everything else to keep in balance the concept of all being one. That being the case, why do not the directors of life leave well alone and sit back to rest on their laurels? This is because change of circumstances relating to all that exists is constant. Time does not exist, 
but sequence of events does, and the moment now is not the same as the moment past or the moment to come. As matter decays and is released following a natural law concerning balance of power, then the systematic following of events brings with it the possibility of corruption occurring. This, in turn, is under the control of a force of beings whom we normally consider malign. They are not so. They exist to clean up the debris after anything has declined and are an essential part of life. They have their parallel on earth. There are many creatures who exist to dispose of the waste of sentient life who perform a vital role in maintaining a balanced environment where life can continue, but they too have to be kept under control. Similarly, in the area of life under discussion, the complement of the directors of life perform a vital function but they would perform it too well if the directors of life relaxed, and thus they strive to pick up the pieces after something has declined and thrust it forward with suitable modifications. Therefore we portray an existence where nothing is stationary. Even after the death of an object or creature, the essential logos or concept is pulled either towards perfection or towards decline. Gradually, matter is wrestled from the grasp of those archangels who work for decay, and that matter is brought safely within the enfolds of the power of the directors of life. Remember that matter refers not only to that in a physical sense, but also in terms of the several layers that contribute to its totality. Once that matter is claimed, then the opportunity exists for it to be manipulated and altered in concept in preparation for taking up a new role as a constituent part of some other live object. To illustrate the point, we might consider a plant, a daffodil, which in the spring thrusts upwards its leaves towards the light, flowers, fades, and then the leaves eventually will die back. The energy released by the death of the leaves is considered by gardeners to contribute to the growth of the bulb or root of that plant. It is said that the energy returns down the leaves and into the bulb again the goodness nourishing that plant. The result is a growth of that particular bulb and, hopefully, birth of several more small bulbs, each destined to become fully-fledged daffodils in furtherance of that species of plant's continued existence. However, the facts are slightly different than appears from a simple examination of the physical events. It is true that the leaves die back, and it is also true that nutrients are returned into the bulb, but at different levels other events are occurring. Whilst the process of decay of the leaves of a daffodil are, is occurring, the angelic forces charged with producing decay are hard at work causing a breakdown of the tissue of the leaves, so causing nutrients to be released. But, at the same time, and perhaps more importantly from the daffodil's point of view, the directors of life are ensuring that the energy released in terms of the atoms that constitute physical nutrient is examined as regards the higher level of those atoms and... From those higher levels, slight changes to the genetic makeup are affected that will cause minute changes to occur within the format of the daffodil in line with slight changes occurring on the planet Earth in terms of soil constituents, temperature, moisture, and also changes in the orbit of the Earth in relation to the sun.
These genetic changes are designed to ensure that whatever conditions prevail on Earth, the plant will survive because it has been altered to fit its changing environment, a process known as adapting to change. Thus, to make it clear, we will elucidate further by stating that during the process of decay of a leaf of the plant under discussion, the original atom in a physical sense becomes altered by changes being affected to its structure by manipulation of its auras. It is a fact that in the spiritual terms under consideration, the higher the vibration, the more easily may matter be manipulated, and so the directors of life start at the top, at the aura of highest vibration, effect the required change, and then cause that change to be reflected in lower and lower auras until the physical atom becomes altered. However, the process of change uses energy. That energy must be obtained from somewhere. There is only one source of energy in the universe, and that is obtained from raised matter. As the vibration rate of matter is increased, so it emits energy rather like the process of blowing on a dully glowing ember of coal and causing it to glow more brightly. The change from dull red to almost white is mirrored by a release of heat energy. This analogy is not scientifically correct and is used merely to illustrate the point and those who have immediately picked up the flaws in that description should not, therefore, suppose that the information being disseminated is also flawed. The concept of energy being released as the vibration rate is increased is true, and is the backbone of continued existence by everything that was, is, and ever will be. To return to the dying leaf, energy is drawn from the process by taking the logos, or concept of life, at a near physical level and spiritualizing that energy so as to transfer that logos into the next aura. The process is repeated until the logos, life force, call it what you will, reaches powerfully to the highest aura. This process, which amongst sentient beings is largely left to those beings is effected by the directors of life. Once the life force has reached the highest aura, the changes mentioned above are caused and then the process of returning that life force down the auras and into the physical structure of the atom is effected. The atom now not being quite the same as it was when it began to be manipulated. The energy released by the process of raising vibration is, of course, returned to the atom during the process of descent, and balance is restored. As was mentioned earlier, such change is designed to allow the plant the greatest possible opportunity to develop in an ever-changing environment to ensure the ongoingness of that plant. Of course, no one is perfect, and sometimes changes wrought by the directors of life are not compatible with the environment that alters in unpredictable ways, and so that particular plant or group of plants fails to survive. However, you must realize that the process of change is being wrought upon every plant all over the world, and so many do survive. Some alter and become new species by a process gardeners call sports, which are changes occurring in a somewhat unpredictable manner as a result of the genetic engineering being wrought from on high. Therefore, the auras surrounding that atom of a leaf of a daffodil will alter as vibration is raised or lowered and as energy is created or absorbed. 
The process occurs fairly slowly in a plant, and so, to those of clairvoyant vision, little or no change would occur during any period of observation. Nevertheless, these changes do occur and could be examined by a clairvoyant of sufficient talent, experience and patience. Great stock is taken of colours relating to the aura. One might question why auras have colour at all. The answer is quite simple in terms of acceptance of earthly colours. White light from the sun is composed of many individual colours. The reason why this is so will not be discussed at this point. Let us accept that white light may be observed to contain the colours of the rainbow and every other possible combination that the eye and the brain can quantify. It may be scientifically verified that white light is composed of a wide spectrum of vibrations and each band of vibrations corresponds to a colour. Thus we know and accept that red is of a much lower rate of vibration than blue, blue being much higher in terms of vibration than red. The other colours fit in between or expand above and below the blue and red according to their vibrancy rate. It was stated earlier that an atom has a physical body and has seven auras. The physical body of that atom is bathed with white light from the sun and because it vibrates it will respond in sympathy to the rate of vibration of a colour of the solar spectrum. The first aura of an atom has its reality in a world identical to that of Earth, though removed in terms of a different set of vibrations. Therefore, the first aura will correspond to a colour commensurate to the vibrancy rate of light being emitted by that auric sun. And so the process goes on. Thus, each aura can be seen to glow a particular colour according to its vibrating rate. These colours may be termed the atom's base or quiescent colours. As energy is raised or lowered through the auras of that atom by the directors of life, so, of course, the auras would increase or decrease in vibration and would, therefore, change colour as they vibrate in sympathy with whatever band of the white light they are corresponding to in any particular auric solar system. This image may be understood more readily should one consider a situation in which matter is caused to vibrate in sympathy with a magnetic field as is achieved in a microwave. Although in that case colour is not involved, the action of causing an object to raise its vibration rate releases energy in the form of heat. Should that energy be contained within a perfect vacuum, it would remain in the same state hot forever. However, nothing remains stationary. The perfect vacuum cannot be achieved in practice and, therefore, heat will slowly escape into the surrounding atmosphere until the object under consideration returns to ambient temperature. The heat released into the atmosphere would be equal to the energy used to create the magnetic field originally. Therefore, balance in terms of energy is maintained. To return to a point that was discussed briefly earlier on in this study of the auras, we were considering what events were necessary in order to regulate the flow of energy through those force fields that constitute auric growth. It is in the interest of the student to try to comprehend the nature of life. It is considered by those incarnate on earth and who are sufficiently tied to it not 
to realize the magnificence of God's only creation, that life is connected with an object's electrical field, and that may be seen to stimulate nerves of a sentient creature and follows the outline of a plant. But, just as the mystery of what is God could not be answered, similarly, life is a concept that equates with God and will remain unquantifiable. Those of you who have followed the course of certain individuals, growing cultures, cloning creatures, and perhaps fooling themselves that they were getting closer to solving the mystery, will be disillusioned. The creation of life is not within the gift of man. Nor yet is the answer to where and how life is created known to any person living in the higher realms of light. Certainly, it seems that the angelic forces that work for the power of God handle and manipulate life once it is created, but as to the origin of the creation of life, we merely accept that it is. We too like to investigate, and we have a number of theories as to how life originates, but because we do not know for certain, we refrain from speculation. Like you, we accept that we are alive and we know that we will live for as long as it is possible to imagine. We also know that the destiny of all life is to merge with the Godhead so that the circle of life can continue. But we cannot describe the nature of life. We cannot give you the formula for making it. We cannot cut up a body and remove that life organ as we might with the liver, spleen or heart. Similarly, and tied to the concept of life, is the soul. The soul is not the spirit of God within man. It is a vehicle. It is the vehicle that contains the essence of life, rather like the shell of an egg contains the essence of a chicken. The soul will always remain in conjunction with the life force, protecting it and keeping it intact at least until the pair, soul and life force, merge with God. After that, we lose track of it, and so we cannot comment. However, we wish you to realize that in association with you and all your various auras, you have a final essence, the life force, and that life force is and will remain within that object called the soul. However, the soul has no special power and is not to be venerated. It is no more than a protective coating round a nut. The life force, which is both part of and the totality of the Spirit of God, is that which should be venerated, because it is God himself. The soul, of course, occupies no space and therefore is not actually within you. It is associated with you and is an essential part of you, but is, in terms of vibration, even above the highest aura. Your soul is, because it is of God and God is all in one, unique and separate from every other soul and yet, at the same time, is one and part of every soul that is. If you cannot grasp that concept intuitively, do not try to analyze it intellectually. You will not grasp the concept. You will grow to accept the truth as you grow in soul growth. Therefore, it is clear that as all is one, and all is God, and all is alive, therefore, everything has a life force, and equally everything has a soul. Do not accept Christian doctrines that plants and animals do not have a soul. It is false doctrine stated by those who should know better. Realize that as you interrelate with plants, animals, indeed 
rocks, sand, water, and everything that is, that it is all alive. It all has a soul, and that life force and soul is at one with you, separated from your mind only by your and its ego and personality. Think of this should you eat an animal, kill a fly, and hack down a weed. They are not lesser than you. They are exactly equal to you and are indeed you. Treat all life as you would wish that life would treat you. Because if you should deliberately harm anything, you are harming yourself. On the subject relating to consummation of food for health and to maintain your body, refer to the chapter on diet. Having attempted to quantify at least to some extent, that mysterious life force, we now turn to examine how that force relates to the human body. Mention was made earlier of a daffodil and attempts made to indicate that each atom of the plant exists in more areas than just the physical and that the totality of its physical and auric reality were one. We stop in our examination of atoms at this point because, in reality, we are not portraying the exact truth. We feel obliged to present the information about a point of life and how it exists and use the term atom to represent points of life. In fact, atoms do not exist as rounded solid objects, and therefore we are using them as an example rather than portraying truth. We feel that if we tried to present to you the facts concerning singular points of life, A, you would possibly not comprehend, and B, we would upset the balance of scientific knowledge by bypassing the long years that science has yet to take to relate to the truth. Also, it must be said that such concepts, as are alluded to, are capable of misuse, as has been the atom, and we do not wish to add to man's arsenal of destruction. So, to repeat, there is a life force that runs throughout the total concept of each individual point of life, which we will still refer to as atoms. At some point, a single atom has to decide whether it is going to form a drop of water, a piece of rock, a plant, an animal, or a human. And so we will consider why it is that the atoms that constitute a human do so instead of constituting a rock. If, in essence, it is true that every individual concept of life which may be considered to be at the centre of every atom, originates from God, is the same and is one, it follows that, in essence, there is no difference between you and a piece of stone. And yet, clearly, that is not so. You are a much more advanced form of life than a stone and will always remain so. What is it that makes the difference? Certainly not God, God creates, but he does not differentiate. He does not predispose certain points of life force with greater sentience than others. He creates all equally. Therefore, at some point, a singular life force must be directed to become a human and another must be chosen to become a rock. There are directors of life mentioned previously, an archangelic force who themselves are not human and could not be imagined by humans who take the differentiated life forces and direct them to become what is needed, rather like a farmer might have a stream and direct it first into one field and then into another as irrigation was required. It is a rather sobering thought that the life force which is the essence of you and which so many humans consider elevates them to greater importance could so easily have been used to make a dog 
or a pig, a geranium or a cabbage, a stone or a raindrop. If this opens your eyes to the fact that you are no more important than a raindrop, then you will have learned a valuable lesson. However, human you are as you were created, and human you are destined to remain. With it come certain obligations in terms of the raising or spiritualizing of matter to further the ongoingness of life, and therefore much effort is being, has been, and will be expended to assist you in realizing the soul growth necessary to achieve that raised power. Once the directors of life have located a deficit in any particular area, and we branch off once again to suggest that there are areas of life far beyond the planet Earth and far beyond the ken of even the most knowledgeable of you, they reach into that bank of life and release a certain amount of it. Let us suppose that it is decided to create humans. The life force drawn from the bank is then prepared in the required fashion. It would be placed within the force field called the soul, and energies would be directed at it which would give it certain characteristics. We do not describe these energies because it is not possible so to do. One cannot describe gravity, electricity or the power of love. One can only describe their effects. Electricity is often quantified as that force that. Such description tells one of its effects, but ignores completely the nature of the force itself. Therefore, we will not try to pull the wool over your eyes except to say that a life force may be imbued with that force that gives the life force human characteristics. We hope that you will appreciate the dilemma that such a hopeless description places us in. We feel a burning desire to be open and honest with you, but in such areas, language does not exist to quantify such concepts. We merely ask you to accept that such forces exist which can and do give definition to differentiated life force. Once this has been achieved, of course, the life force may be considered to be an embryo human. However, it consists of its life force, its soul, its human stamp and nothing else. So begins a long process of movement down from the elevated plane in which the embryo was created onto a lower plane. That first lower plane would be the highest or seventh plane to which humans later ascend. In order to reach that plane and relate to it, a force field is pulled round the soul by a process akin to gravity, and that soul now has an aura round it. That aura is, like the soul itself, merely a vehicle that enables the Spirit of God to relate to the seventh plane, rather like a body enables you to relate to the earth. Later, the life force with its soul and seventh aura begins to descend to the sixth plane. As it approaches it, so another aura of the sixth plane merges, and now the life force can relate to life on that planet. This process goes on until that life force merges with a human body at the moment of birth, and we say that a baby is born. The human body is, of course, merely an aura when considered in the light of the above information, just as the auras may be considered to be bodies when viewed from the point of view of an earthly concept. Once the point is reached that results in a baby being born, of course the nadir or low point is reached 
in terms of descent, and it is up to the individual to begin to spiritualize himself in order, in effect, to do the work that, in the plant and mineral kingdoms, is achieved by the directors of life, namely to spiritualize or raise energy back upwards through the auras until a state is reached where one has filled each aura with raised power. The subject of the effects and details appertaining to raised power at each stage or aura will be dealt with in due course. We wish to make it clear to you that you are in effect on a cyclical course. You originated from God at the highest point conceivable, you descended into manhood and now you are struggling to raise yourself back to the point where you started. Does this seem pointless? Well, it does and is pointless if you expect life to contain some great importance as regards yourself or if you imagined that you and your fellow men are in some manner divine above and beyond the divinity within any inanimate object. We are sorry to disillusion you. You are extremely important in one sense and one sense only. You are part of a cycle of raising power, rather like being part of a stream being used to turn a water wheel. The water wheel represents the ongoingness of all existence and the stream represents all life. All life plays a vital part in raising energy and you merely act in a higher, more powerful sense than a raindrop. But, essentially, the need of a human being and a raindrop in God's plan are of equal importance. It is an essential part of the master plan. But do not be dismayed. Having perhaps destroyed any delusion of grandeur that you may have been accustomed to through absorbing the teachings of orthodox religions and perpetrated by those who wished to exploit nature for their own greed, we now wish to reassure you that, being human, you are indeed the chosen ones of God. As was mentioned earlier, the differentiated life force is made into anything that requires to be manufactured by the directors of life. And it is pure chance that you were made into a human. Having been selected by chance, you are now destined to lead an existence beyond your wildest imagination. Do not suppose that the drab world that you inhabit presently is indicative of all of creation. It is not. It is like living in a vast, most beautiful palace, and you have merely seen the coal store. When you have climbed the stairway to freedom, you will be qualified to leave that black area and to visit and stay in the vast marbled halls which constitute the bulk of the palace. However, we speak metaphorically, of course. There are no palaces, no rooms in real life, but there is something much better. There are states of bliss that transcend your wildest euphoric states imaginable, and the states of bliss are piled one on top of another in never-ending form, each one infinitely more exhilarating than the previous. The key to reaching those states is to follow the precepts given in this publication and to allow the power of God to fill all your auras, all your realities, driving out any base, fear-ridden concepts. You do not have to believe this to be true. Try meditation. Try devotion to God. Try prayer. Try to follow the advice given and you will see for yourself that it is all true and more. There is no limit to the joy that you can experience, only the limit that you place upon yourself. Should you find that all this is beyond you, then do not feel guilty. Until you are ready, you cannot make the adjustment. But, we beg you, once you are ready to ascend the stairway to freedom, to life, 
do not remain in the coal cellar under the illusion that it is safe and comfortable, warm and friendly, and because those who are your leaders are there. Should any of your leaders, elders and self-appointed betters, stop the roundabout of illusion upon which they ride for one instant and visualize the brighter area waiting above them, they would abandon you in a moment. They ride the roundabout alone and in isolation, and they feel no brotherliness towards you. They merely use you for the benefit of their own egos and would leave you to dwell alone without a second thought if they had the chance to better themselves. You too walk in isolation, and although you feel the desire for togetherness, you will not find it in their company. True brotherly love awaits on the higher planes, and you have a much greater chance of rising to those planes than those to whom you currently bow down. Leave them to be masters of nothing. The slaves may be free and may cross the river Jordan. Leave the Egyptians in the cellar to rant and rave, to make their plans exploiting themselves alone. You do not need them. They need you but you deserve a better master. Make God your master and serve only him. Then you can live in the land of Canaan in peace and in harmony with yourself and with all life. Do not believe we are telling you the truth. Try it for yourself, and we promise that you will realize that it is all true. Who knows? Perhaps by your example... Politicians, leaders of churches, leaders of trades unions, and all those who now exploit the masses will realize the error of their ways and may turn in prayer to God, and instead of exhorting the masses to be slaves to their own half-baked theories, they may begin to loose the shackles so that individuals may too cross the divide between slavery and freedom. You will have noticed, of course, that we used the story of Moses to illustrate the point that we made above. There are many, many stories in the Bible, and none of them actually refer to historic events. They are all cleverly encoded accounts of your relationship with God and with your fellow man. The chosen people, the Israelites, are liberated souls, not just of the Hebrew faith, but of all faiths and of all races and of all situations. The Egyptians are not the people of that country, but represent all who enslave the minds and hearts of free men wherever they are situated. It may come as a shock to anybody of the Jewish faith to realize that they are not God's chosen people, but that is the fault of the rabbis who should have reached beyond the limits of the Torah and looked into their own souls to find truth. They should have known that God creates all men equal. You make yourself a chosen one by aligning yourself with God. It is in your hands and your hands alone. Thus it is that God may be found on a mountain top or in a prison dungeon. There are no bars to keep God from your heart and it is unforgivably criminal of anyone who has an inkling of the truth concerning God to keep it from the public through financial, theological or political reasons. The truth concerning God must and will be made available to all men, not the garbled, stereotyped image perpetrated by most books and by most servants of churches, but the glorious freedom experienced in the hearts of those who seek instead of believing intellectually, who know through personal experience instead of acquired second-hand knowledge. 
Then may the world begin to be set to rights. Then may peace begin. Then may the Prince of Peace truly sit on his throne in the kingdom of God. We ask you in peace and in love to join that throng marching through the wilderness to freedom. It is your ultimate destiny. Do not put it off for one more day. You may have all of eternity before you, but, oh, how precious is each moment, how beautiful and how vital the course that we ask you to follow. Think on these words and, if you doubt them, pray for guidance. If you accept them, join us. We ask, however, that if and when you do join us, you do so completely. There is no room for a part-time saviour. Allow yourself plenty of time to adjust to your lifestyle, but ultimately we require you to follow the instructions contained within this book to the letter. We also ask you to act sensibly. We do not require you to change your lifestyle. We do not ask you to give up your employment nor to retire to a monastery. We ask you to adjust within, to live in peace with all men, to follow the diet applicable to your birth sign as far as is correct for you, but we do warn you to consult a doctor if you have any doubts about your health and to consider diet as part of a routine of devotion to God. We ask you to be considerate to all life, to pray, to meditate, and to analyze yourself daily. We also require you to respect your own intellect, which may be powerful or weak. Some can accept a life of prayer and rise to greatness on it. Others of weaker intellect become cranks. We do not wish any of you to practice any austerities. We do not require you to walk about with the end is nigh boards on your body. We specifically forbid you to mutilate yourself or to reach a point where you consider suicide as a means of reaching the other side. We specifically forbid you from harming any person, creature or thing that refuses to conform to your newfound salvation. In short, should you be of a somewhat weak-willed nature, we would prefer that you do not attempt to follow the path to salvation with any great vigor. You have all of eternity in front of you, and eventually you will mature to the point where you are strong and can take up the reins and be a leader amongst men. Further, we make one final admonition. As you develop spiritually, you will develop the gifts of the Spirit. You will achieve powers that should be used for the benefit of mankind. However, just as electricity can be used to provide the motive power behind a heart pacemaking machine, or to energize an electric chair used in some prisons, so the raised power behind the gifts of the Spirit are susceptible to misuse. There is great temptation initially to use your powers to smooth your daily round to provide those things that karma has not provided you with and to bring you amusement. Do not be so tempted. You will incur great penalty and could have the gifts removed from you. Jesus, when confronted by Pontius Pilate, mentioned that he could have used his powers to save himself from the fate that awaited him, but he realized that he was obliged to tread that path. Follow the example of Jesus. Use your powers to help others and you will be blessed by God. Reject any thoughts of using that power for self-help or for evil. The study of the auras, as was mentioned at the beginning, is long 
and complex. The auras which constitute a part of everything thus interrelate with God and with the most base concept imaginable. Therefore, the auras are an integral part of all that is. As such, in fact, no book on esoteric matters would be complete without such study, and also a study of the auras is all that is necessary to quantify knowledge on esoteric matters. As such, it must be appreciated that the degree of depth obtained by these few pages will not afford any comprehensive study to be made, and it is proposed at a later date that a thick volume be produced which will provide a consensus of all the knowledge that is currently available concerning the auras. Naturally, such a book will in itself be a complete primer of spiritual knowledge, but its slant will be from the point of view of the auras. Therefore, we wish to make it quite clear to the student that we have merely touched upon the subject, that sufficient information has been made available for the student to appreciate his relationship with God and with all life, and that we will complete the task of bringing enlightenment to the people of this world by compiling the volume mentioned above. We hope, should you feel the need, that you will make the effort of reading this new proposed book and that it will create an even firmer base to your foundation of spirituality. We ask you to attune yourself always to the power of God flowing through the auras and to appreciate the immensity of that power.